Greetings, bookworms, and welcome to the Bearded Book Club's production of Sky's End by Mark Gregson. If you want to follow along in this and all of our productions, make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications so you will be notified of all new videos as well as when we do our live shows. If you would like to support Bearded Book Club, you could do so in two ways, both of which are listed in this video's description. Number one, you can become a member of the YouTube channel and or become a Patreon and support us on a regular basis. Or number two, you can go to our Amazon wish list and send us a book as a one-time donation. So without further ado, let us continue. Chapter 3 I'm hobbling down a middle street like a fish struggling upstream. Panicked people push past me. They pour out of their houses and rush for the highs. Above us, near the rich manors, anti-G cannons blast explosive pellets into the sky. The air erupts with blue flames, brightening the shadowy serpents that circle overhead. A gargantan screeches. We drop to our knees and cover our ears. Children wail. No one stops to help. There are a few deaths worse than writhing alive inside a gargantan's belly. Pain throbs up my legs. Adrenaline and balancing... On the cane helps, but I only have so much strength. Suddenly a middleman smacks into me. I hit the ground, and all at once the crowd rushes over me. Boots stomp my fingers, crush my hands, legs. I shout, trip a man with my cane before he can smash my bones, and crawl through slush to reach the alley. My left pinky curves sideways. I snap it back into place, pain bolting through me, but I've no time to recover. Musket to mother. I limp through the alleys. As I round the corner, the silvery underbelly of a gorganton slides above. Holy hell, it's enormous. Maybe a class four, over four hundred feet. I gape in terror and awe as the beast's body goes on and on. It's a giant, soaring ribbon of steel scales. The gorganton's head twists toward the island mouth opening. Then, like a shovel, its jaws grind across whole low neighborhoods, consuming houses and screaming people. Before it came back for another serving, a rush of anti-G pellets crashes against its side. Little detonations go off, sending blasts of heat through my hair. I start running, teeth gnashing as pain stings my legs. I'm the one idiot going the wrong way. On Homestead, the homes of the middles and the highs are connected to the emergency system. Their lights shut off immediately when the sirens activate, but the lows aren't connected to the system. Our homes are heated with fire, lit with candles, and, and already the lows start to burn. More gargantons zoom, attracting, attracted to the growing firelight. Around the next bend, I stand atop a slope, glimpsing the horror below. The lows are a mass of rubble and flame as gargantons scoop up entire streets, the bees shred the ground beneath their metal jaws. Homes crunch under their horrendous teeth. Voices go silent as wood cracks. An instinctual fear begs me to go back towards the highs, but as neighborhoods vanish, I spot McGill's tavern and the yellow glow where Mother sleeps. I never should have left her. Just above the tavern, a Class I gorganton dips its head, lowering its 100-foot body toward... I shout... Bash a pair of garbage lids together, jump up and down, wave my arms. But nothing works. My eyes well. Mother! Before the beast can swallow the tavern whole, a black shape rockets towards the lows. It flies so near to the ground that the wind topples several shacks and sends me sprawling. It's the Golius. Admiral Gorner's battlecruiser flies like a black arrow, firing its massive guns with barrels longer than ten men, and when they shoot, the sky cracks. The ensuing explosion so powerful, the shockwave slams me into a pair of crates. Angry flame spreads along the scales of the Class I Gorganton. The beast thrashes as its scales sear red. It jettisons the fiery scale, sending dozens of glowing metallic discs over the city. The other Gorgantons raise their massive heads to toward the Golius. Their golden eyes glow with hate. The Titans battle. I try to stand, but my grip on the cane falters. My body's so weak, not even the adrenaline helps anymore. Another Gorganton screeches and launches after the Golius. 
The beast's tail, sharp as a scimitar, drags through the alley towards me. It cuts the earth as it scrapes past. Then with a violent slash, it slices the brick building behind me in two. The building starts to moan. Bricks fall all around me. One strikes my back, sending me tumbling. I'm dazed. When I turn, the whole wall leans forward, coming to smash me. Suddenly a pair of hands catches my shoulders. They heave me backward and slide me down the icy alley. The wall smashes the ground where I'd seen Ben seconds ago. My vision circles while I cough on dust. A girl steps from the haze. Around my age with spiky hair that rises like blonde fire. Blue eyes as wild as Homestead River. Our gazes meet. In her clean gray suit, she clear, she's clearly no low. Who are you? I ask, my voice scratchy. She runs off into the smoke. Hey! I call after her. But she's gone. By the time I limp into the lows, the fire has spread. Melting the snow, my lungs burn despite breathing through my sleeve. The Goliath, dwarfed and surrounded by the entire pod, gets rammed. The collision booms. Orders flagship spins through the air, firing in all directions, some blast hitting the lows, but before the pod can finish it off, the Goliath straightens itself and zooms for the horizon, luring every serpent away from the island, saving us. I don't even feel relieved. Each step causes a sharp pain up my side. The smoke stings my eyes and makes me cough. I hurry through the streets. People throw buckets of water onto their burning homes. Others shout for loved ones. Some sit in the streets, eyes staring off, their soot-covered faces blank among the chaos. Entire neighborhoods are missing, flattened. Pillars of wood rise from the earth like the ribs of a corpse. Finally, I come around a corner and stop, staring in shock at the destroyed mess of buildings beyond. This was my street. My cane clicks against the ground as I hobble in a panic, past the old crumbly stone wall, past the small market where I'd sometimes barter for bread, and I stop, belly tingling, before the smoldering remains of McGill's tavern. Gone. I drop my cane, then race forward. My feet burn in the ash, eyes grow wet. I search, dig under charred boards, get cut on broken glass. Eventually I find Mother's old mattress, burned to its rusted springs, and there's nothing left. All gone. Gone. I stumble backwards. Maybe I shout or cry. Not sure. And when I finally realize I haven't breathed, my lungs fill again. Mother. I stand, fall, rise again, and stumble to the curb. For several minutes I sit, feeling ready to vomit. Completely disgusted with myself for not being here. For breaking my promise to her that I'd protect her. She can't be gone, can't. But as the realization slides down my back like ice, a horrible emptiness swallows me whole. What was the last thing she said to me? She wanted me to be better. To not take. The last words of Elise of Hale. I'm about to stand, run, and never stop running again, when a gentle hand lowers onto my shoulder. Above me stands the strongest woman I've ever known, and she's no longer the frail person I tucked in at night, no longer the woman I nursed with lukewarm soup. No, she's the noble lady of Homestead again, the woman who once commended the winds as easily as my father's heart. She smiles at me, but she's not real. McGill looks down at me. I, I tried, he says, reaching my cane to me. My head lowers, and I wonder what I'll become without her. A fresh layer of snow mixed with ash dust that the tavern's remains, and the early sun melts the snow crowning my head. My numb body prickles. My teeth chatter. I should move, find shelter, rest, but no matter where I go, I'll not escape the horrible guilt noosing around my heart. It should have been there. Death and destruction fill the street. Orphan children, desperate husbands searching for wives, crying mothers kneeling over lifeless family. This is the suffering of the lows. We take the brunt so the highs can continue in comfort, and when we suffer, we stay weak, so we'll rarely have strength to challenge those above us. A tear travels my cheeks. 
Mother died for nothing. I had no hope of returning Ella. Probably wouldn't even recognize me even if she did, and I'd have nothing to offer her that Uncle couldn't provide. My head sinks. Sunlight glows over the hovering ships of the low dock in the distance. A few sky ships, old wooden models with masts rather than crystal engines, come to port. Arriving sailors stare at the destruction. A few run from their ships, seeking family. McGill stops at my side. Last night he asked me to stay with him and his family, closer to the middles. They would have spared space on their floor for me, but I couldn't leave Mother. Never again. Heard the outposts were overrun, McGill says. The Gorgantons came so quickly, they couldn't react, so we... took the brunt. He scratches his wrinkly, hairy jaw. I know this isn't the best time, but... Your mother gave me this when she first got sick, in case... Well... He lifts his dirty jacket to expose a long box beneath. Cracks cover its aged surface. He lowers it onto my lap. Heavy. The silver crest of Erwin, an eagle with outstretched talons, decorates the lid. I stare, astonished. This box by itself could have bought Mother and me food for a month, and McGill knows it. When I look up at the old man, I respect him more than ever before. How easily he could have stolen it. He pats my back. You know where to find me, son. Then after glancing at what used to be his tavern, McGill exhales, pulls, on it, uh, pulls up his collar, and strides away, hands in his jacket pockets. Whatever this box contains came from the manor before Mother and I were banished. And at that thought, with so many spying eyes around, I hurry towards the docks, hike up the stone steps into the low gardens, and find a secluded bench that survived the attack. Under the outstretched branches of a pine tree, I open the lid. My mouth gapes, and immediately I reach in and grip Mother's cane. A white rod topped with a black stag, the emblem of the Hales. The cane's surface has its share of cracks, many from the time she practiced with Father, but others from before she met him. I tuck the cane into my shirt. Then I stare at the twelve golden coins in the base of the box. Each is engraved with the symbol of one of the trades. I thumb the first few. Agriculture, order, scholar, each bearing the trade's emblem. Two ears of corn, a fist, an open book. My hands tremble. If only she'd given me this box earlier, we could have rented our own apartment nearer to the safer middles, and maybe we couldn't have a heat globe or been able to afford more medicine. Why keep these from me? A cold wind brushed by, and I can almost hear her voice. I couldn't give it to you earlier, she says. Why not? Because you would have spent it. On what? Me. The thought rips my heart in two. Makes me bite my quivering lips so hard it bleeds. I sit in agony, watching the gray sky, crying. Above me, glinting under the dawn light, stands the home of my ancestors, Erwin Manor. Mother may be gone, but I'm not alone. She didn't say it when she was alive and awake, but she desperately wanted her daughter back. Mother whispered to Ella in her sleep and talked to Ella when she thought I wasn't around. Oh, you have twigs in your hair again, Ella. Look at your feet, Ella, just like your brother, always running around barefoot. I swear you'll lose a toe. I tuck the box under my arm and as wind splashes through my hair. Mother was right. I spend my first coin on her funeral. After the tavern's final embers burn out, I dig through the warm ash in search of her remains. When I find them, I wrap her in a blanket and rent a little boat. Then together with the sound of the puttering crystal engine, we float into a bright sky. Once we're away from the island, we sit together, just us, enjoying the peace. Enjoying the feeling of the wind's gentle kiss. Enjoying our last moment together. I talk to her. Tell her everything. Tell her I'm sorry I wasn't there. But I don't make promises that I can't keep. To get Ella back, I'll have to get... I'll have to let go of my softer side... I'll have to be as rotten and ruthless as the highs above. The one promise I do make is the one that'll be the most difficult to achieve, but I won't fail. After I dry my nose and eyes, I lift her body 
and then I hold her tight like I did all those nights when she seized. My voice quivers as I sing the song of failing, of falling. Its mournful verses mark at all funerals. Tell of how everyone lives to rise, gain status and riches, but in the end we're all equal. In the end, we all fall. I let mother go, returning her to the sky. As she falls, I say a silent prayer, hoping that wherever the winds take her, she'll find peace.